You're listening to the Fitposium Podcast, your exclusive source for information and inspiration to grow your brand and succeed as a fitness entrepreneur. Here's your host, photographer, public speaker, business coach, and the founder of Fitposium, James Patrick. That is right. This is a Fitposium Podcast, and that's also right. I'm your host, James Patrick. Hope you guys are having an amazing winter break between Christmas and New Year's. Um, as of when this is going up, we are just a few days away from 2019, and thus, perfect chance to get our good friend Billy Polson on the show. And this interview, you guys are going to love it. This interview is all about what we need to do, what our strategy is for how we set our goals for the new year, what we can do to make sure that we're setting hard goals, goals that we can actually push ourselves to, how we can scale our business, and what that looks like in a steady pace versus opposed to sprinting. Uh, Billy breaks down a ton of strategies and gives lots and lots and lots of resources for you that we're going to link in the show notes. Truly hope you guys enjoy this episode. Um, While you are clicking online, go ahead, head over to Amazon, get yourself a copy of my new book, Fit Business Guide, the workout plan for your brand. And uh, I'd also love if you give it five stars on Amazon. Thank you guys so much. And we will talk to you in the new year. So here is your interview with Billy Polson. All right. I got, he doesn't know he's my new best friend, but I got my new best friend, Billy Polson on the line. How's it going, sir? <laughs> How are you, James? I am doing great. It is so awesome to uh, digitally see your face. I haven't seen you in literally two months since, uh, since you were out in Arizona at Fiposium. To the date, exactly. It has flown by, I will tell you that. <laughs> I, I can't believe how much it's flown by. I mean, well, post Fiposium, like I went straight from Fiposium into wedding mode <laughs> and then- <laughs> into honeymoon mode and now I'm post honeymoon mode pre 2019 new year's mode which is I'm not sure what to do with myself mode right it's and holiday mode is squeezed in there somewhere like, oh yes. my goodness yeah so what's what's been going on uh with you and uh and all things with you your business uh since since the conference you know what I have to admit Leading up to the conference was a little bit of a marathon for me, and the conference was a little bit of a finish line. So I honestly, I committed to myself that the last couple months of this year, I would not try and be sprinting. Mm-hmm. So I have tried to slow to a, what is considered a steady pace for me that is still uh, absolutely no free time, but <laughs> I'm not at least sprinting anymore. Uh, and just trying to do some wrap up and Honestly, I just posted today on Instagram, it's one of my favorite times of year because I love the dream sequence of dreaming up what you want to do for the upcoming year. I honestly yes. am a planner. I love it. I love the plan. And planning was, uh, was really a core component of your sessions at Fitposium this year. Definitely. I, even in, uh, whether it was at the uh, Fitposium session or even we just did a vision planning session with our team here in San Francisco on Tuesday, uh, I find so much value for myself to really put things down on paper, to put it on the schedule. And most importantly for me is planning it on a calendar. Mm. I have to be able to see the visual of that layout of when things will get done and put some deadlines down. It's really the only way that I feel like I check things off the list efficiently. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because this is something that I will do with bigger projects where I will decide on a big project, what is the official launch date of this big project? This whole thing needs to be done by this date. That date goes on the calendar. But then I have to reverse engineer it to figure out all the milestone dates that lead up to that. And unless they go on the calendar, it's so easy. Even if the, even if the end goal is on the calendar, if you're not hitting those milestones or if you haven't chunked this out, it's so easy to just keep pushing that, that, that finish line further and further and further uh, down you know, month after month into the calendar. Most definitely. And it, part of the reason that most people don't sit and really plan that much in advance is it takes a lot of time. It yep. does. You do feel like, oh, I'll just do it. I'm wasting my time with this giant plan. But if you are truly trying to uh, have some ideas in mind and what is actually achievable in the next 12 months, you have to have not only looked at what is the big idea you're heading towards, but you need to break that down to a macro, to probably a series of macro tasks. And then those need to break, be broken down to the micro tasks. And honestly, the micro tasks are what I assign the time to. 
uh, like for example, if I'm trying to build a website, mm -hmm. and then I the one of the macros to be writing all of the content. Then the micros would be all of the individual pages that I need to write, yep. and I try and assign a time value to each of those. And literally looking at all those, I can tell you, okay, I'll have all the content written by the end of seven weeks. Mm -hmm. And if you don't literally time it out like that, you're you are aiming at a target that will have to move. There's no way you can guesstimate that well for big projects like that. Why do you think people are avoiding? putting dates down is it more that putting dates down makes it more real and it's easier to keep it as as an idea or is there another or or is it, or is it an ego thing where we're just like oh you know just just i we're gonna get it done i'm not i'm not worried about the specifics you know that's a very interesting question i think a lot of it depends on personality mm. A lot of us are big dreamers and we think of the big idea. And once we think of the big idea and a little of the logistics, the planning is not our strength. And so we don't want to do that or we leave that to someone else. I think that's one thing. The second thing, again, I would say is maybe some people are really fearful to truly put that plan and put mm -hmm. that exactness down because they don't want to miss it or fail. I think yep. that would be a common uh, fear that a lot of folks run into as business owners, for sure. I think there's there's a giant chasm between individuals who will come up and say, I have an idea to do this versus an entrepreneur who says, I am doing this and this is when it's coming out. Mm -hmm, for sure. The plan, the research and planning, in my opinion, is the success factor. Mm -hmm. The more that you do your planning and your research, the higher level of success, the more efficient your work will be. Uh, you'll, uh, that actually is a huge point. Efficiency. Efficiency of being on a schedule and having everything based on deliverables that are related to one another and getting things done in sequence, that's planning and research. And if you don't do that, you'll, yeah, you'll get it done. You probably won't get it done as quickly and you will have no idea when the finish line is going to be. It's coming, but you'll have no idea. So you can't plan the rest of your life around. Yeah. Question on finish line. So you obviously through, through your coaching, you've literally worked with hundreds of, of trainers and entrepreneurs in the health and fitness space, helping them grow and scale their brands and their businesses. And mm -hmm. when, when I look at goals, the, the, issue that I see with so many, so many of the individuals that I coach is they're setting their marks insanely low. Almost, almost like you are going to, if you, if, if you make a mistake, you're still going to fall and hit this goal. Like that's right. how low right. this is. Like you, this, this is not, this is not something you're trying to jump over. It's, it's so low. You, you, you're going to trip over it. Most definitely. And the, playing it safe for sure. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that relates a lot to the fact that a lot of them are very short term in their vision as well. A lot of folks have a really hard time dreaming big and thinking of the possibility of five, 10 years, retirement years down the road. They do not want to or do not have the uh, maybe confidence or courage to look that far down the road. So they set very safe goals for each year. They just hit the baseline. They're just passing. Uh, and I do think that limits a lot of folks, that fear and that uh, lack of creativity or lack of, uh, again, really trying to, to go outside of the balance of what you feel like is safe. And like, I like to think of it as worst case scenario. Try something and challenge it. Mm -hmm. Challenge yourself, but give yourself some worst case scenario options. And are they really that bad if you fail? Like, what's the worst case scenario? Well, and that's, that's exactly my point is who cares if, you did not hit your goal. I mean, it's much better to not hit a very high goal than it is to not challenge yourself because you set a very low goal. Yes, for sure. And I'll be the first to admit, when I set a big goal, I always like to have a plan A, which is the big finish. Yes, mm -hmm. we successfully hit everything. But I love to have a plan B, plan C, plan D for if, if this doesn't work out, plan B will be great as well. And, and so would plan C. A perfect example, the content that I write for the Fitness Entrepreneur 101 coursework, like building your business financial marketing plans, that has been written in hopes that folks anywhere around the world would buy it and need it. Plan B for that is that every single one of our in-house interns uses that on a weekly basis to do all of their work for our in-house case studies. So plan B is, yeah, no one buys it, but everyone in-house still uses it. So if you can come up with a big dream plan, 
if it makes you feel more comfortable, make sure there's a plan B, plan C, that it's still worth your time and it's not going to be a complete wash of time and money spent. Yeah. I do something very similar where I have a good enough goal and a perfect goal. And yeah, we aim for perfect, but we're happy with good enough. Like with, with Viposium this year, good enough was 200 registered attendees. Perfect was 250 and we had 267. So that, that, that was, <laughs> what is that called? <laughs> that's, that, that's perfect called James, James got, James got a few more, a few more hours to, to uh, enjoy his that's what that's called. <laughs> But I w- it was interesting because I was having a conversation with um, with one of my clients this week, and we were reviewing their financial goals for 2019, and their goal was reasonable for because because their intention was they have a full time career, and they want to transition out of that full time career by Q3 of 2019 uh, into mm-hmm. into owning their own uh, health and fitness. Um, uh, freelance business. And we were looking at their, at their numbers that they wanted and, and they were conservative, but realistic. And I said, why would you not want to double this goal? And they said, do you think I could? I'm like, well, more of the question is, why do you think you can't? And they're like, well, I've n- I said, how much have you ever made in a quarter? Like, what is the most you've ever made in a quarter? And they told me the most they ever made in a month. All right. So times by three. And I'm like, okay, have you ever tried to make twice that? And they said, no. And I said, is it, have you never made twice that because you've never tried to make twice that or because you just can't make twice that? And they're like, well, I don't know if I've ever tried to make twice that. I'm like, if we set this goal as twice what, you th- what you're saying it is, what if that was the goal? And Because you've never tried to make that. So let's break it down. What does it look like per week? What does it look like per day? Like, could you build a platform where you're making this much money per day? They're like, well, I suppose I could. I'm like, so you've just never challenged yourself to do that. I, I, I guess so. And so that's I kind of what, what I'm circling around is I think so many people, we're not pushing ourselves to do that, to do something that we thought was not even an option before. Mm-hmm. Quick question on your client. How did you guys go about uh, coming up with that double revenue? Like, was it a rate increase? Was it a number of hours worked? What did you guys do? It, it was both uh, because the way I look at it for, uh, well, in this client in particular, and for so many people who work in the fitness industry, uh, we work as freelancers. Freelancers meaning in order to make a profit, we have to have a client paying us for, for said profit. Uh, mm-hmm. So if we're doing in-training personal services or online services, there's a transaction that goes with that. So really the two ways that you make more money is a, you get more clients. Okay. So you can get more clients and you can increase your revenue, right? So 10 clients is at, at one price is worth more than five clients at the same price. Uh, but you hit a, a ceiling at some point because you only have a finite amount of time. All yeah. right. So at a certain time, all of a sudden it's like, well, I can't take any more clients unless I'm starting to degrade the quality of the work I'm providing. Okay. So then you go into your second option, which is to get better clients. Better clients in this case would be clients who are willing to pay you more for your services. Okay. And so for this client in particular, it was one, they had lots of time to get more clients, but two, they were severely, severely undervaluing the rate of their services. Mm-hmm. Like that's almost. Exactly why I asked. Mm-hmm. That's yep. The, uh, that's exactly why I asked. Yeah, I was curious to see if was it a rate that they needed to adjust. And how did you guys figure out that they were undervaluing it? I mean, if you were to consider like most trainers within their area, most trainers would be minimum 45 to 50% higher than what they were charging. But they, they had this, they had this mentality of, well, I, you know, I, I, even though I've, I have this much experience, like this has been a part-time job for me. And a lot of these are my friends and, and I'm like, you're really selling yourself short here. Like, if you want this higher level of clientele, you should be pricing for this higher level of clientele. Like, it's if, so if, hard for people, though. It is so hard. You, you're like, yes. your client is a perfect example of so many people in our industry. Uh, yeah, I, I hear that all the time. Uh, one of the things I did during my workshop at Fitposium. I found helps folks build their confidence on that. And it was that competitor research uh, bracket or spreadsheet 
So, and honestly, if anyone needs that again, I'm happy to, it's, you, you probably have a copy of it somewhere. I'm sharing it with anyone if they need it. But it was a sheet where they go out and research their top two to four competitors in their market, find out what their rates are, and find out exactly how they rate against them in all of their specialties and differentiators. And it helps open their eyes to, wow, you are right. Like it confirms, James, you're right. I am half charging for a quality of service that is far above and beyond any of my competitors in my market. So yes, you're right. And it gives them the confidence to do it. So mm -hmm. I recommend if someone, and I guarantee you someone listening to this is really scared to raise their rates in 2019, do the research first, do the mm -hmm. research first. It will help you with not only knowing whether or not to raise them, but what to raise them to, how to know that number instead of just doing a turkey shoot. You're just, okay, let's hit the target wherever randomly. Let's uh, be very precise in making that decision and you'll have the confidence to do it and your clients will respect it for sure. Oh, and that's the thing, like having a, a higher rate merits a different level of respect from, mm -hmm. from your clientele and it shows a different level of of, of professionalism. Another thing that we did, and I'm curious if you've ever done this practice is, so some of, some of our clients, what they'll do is they'll have like a package uh, uh, offering. Like let's say it's a monthly package and in this month you get maybe two of these sessions and two check-ins and this and this and this and all this is included. I said, and I asked, I asked him, I says, have you ever figured out how much you're making per hour per client? And they said, no. I said, well, let's look at it. And it was, it was about, $20 an hour that they're making. And I said, what, how does that number feel? And they said, it feels terrible and, and terrifying. Like I'm actually really upset. And I'm just like, now do you believe me that you're undervaluing yourself? Wow. Yes. Oh my gosh. I don't care what market for sure. <laughs> like, well, oh. because they had never added at the time. It's like, okay, so you do two one hour consults. Okay. So that's two hours right there. I said, how long does then, then there's a plan. How long does it take to write that plan? That's another hour. Okay. And then how long is it? And it added up and it was like just over 20 an hour. I was just like, you're doing all this work for 20 an hour at the end of the day. And they're like, oh, I can't, I can't believe that. And so it was like, okay, well, let's, let's now, now the strategy is let's, let's acclimate your clients, not, not just your, not just your rates, but acclimate your clients because the clients who are going to be paying you essentially $20 an hour should, will probably not be paying you what you want to be paid, which is probably two or three times that. Yeah. And you slowly, I mean, I, as I've trained over 20 years, I still have clients that I had trained for 16 years that were a little less than my current rate because I had slowly brought them along, mm -hmm. along thanking them for being a client for 15 years. I'm not going to jack them up to the brand new rate, but you, uh, you let them know, all right, look, Tim, I've had you for 15 years. I'm going to keep you at 130, but my current clients are paying 170. And so I'm, as a thank you, I just continue to give you a $40 discount. So they know they're getting a deal as well as they know that, uh, it, your current clients are paying a lot more. They're getting it up value your service. I think a lot of it is having the confidence and it's unfortunately, it's a bit of a blind confidence, but having the confidence to know that it is okay to say no to someone who cannot afford your services. For sure. And I will be the first to admit one of our number one goals for next year is to make sure that we maintain the ability for general population of all economic levels to have our services. And mm -hmm. in the fitness and health industry, it is something I will say I battle a little bit with San Francisco. Current rates for San Francisco trainers range anywhere 135 up to even like 250 an hour mm -hmm. for personal training. Obviously, a lot of folks in the city cannot afford that. So one of the things that I will say that we're trying to do is, yes, up, like value the trainer and give them what they're worth because Lord knows the folks who are charging 250, they deserve it. They have worked their butt off. They're so well educated, provide an amazing service. At the same time, if someone really needs the care, you want to do anything you can do to try and figure out ways to help them out. Uh, so that is something I will say is a challenge for us because I, it's an industry that I want to be accessible for everyone as well. And, and, and it should be because this is, this is not like most professional services. This is a service where you are actually helping to better uh, the, the outcome of someone's life. One thing that I've done in my photography business 
and it, it's worked well for how I manage my photo clients is let's just say my rate for a certain project is, uh, I'll just throw out a round number, two grand. And from two, out of two grand, you are going to get me for um, uh, one day and you are going to get this many set shots and this many edits. And so basically I can line item it out. And right. then if someone comes back and says, I can only really budget 1500 I have two options. I can say, I'm not a $1,500 photographer, but thank you. Uh, here are some $1,500 photographers that I can refer you to. Or I can say, if I want to, because I have to want to do the project, I could say, okay, here's what I can do for $1,500. And it's not the full day. And it's not this number of edits. And it's not this number of locations. But it's going to be a pairing of that, which, because if I line up everything, I can just contrast my services where they're still getting what they want, what they need, but within a budget that they can afford. I'm wondering if professional exactly. uh, uh, the services within the, the personal training industry can apply something similar of, you know, you want my platinum package. This is what it is. If you can't do that, that's fine. Let's adjust this to meet your budget and your goals. Exactly. And it, a lot of our folks, uh, the, they've tried different versions of that. Like mm -hmm. some of our trainers, for example, they don't get homework workouts if they don't pay the full price or uh, nutrition is an add on the, the, yeah, I think it really depends on the style of the trainer and, and their philosophy of, you know, if you don't need nutrition, are you really going to get any results? And is it really worth the package? And so they're trying to figure out one thing we, that has worked really well is we've dropped uh, or we've allowed folks to just do 30 minute sessions. So mm -hmm. what they'll do instead of paying for the whole hour, they pay a half price, but they come for 30 minutes and then they'll do like 15 minutes of cardio after, or we'll give them a set of exercises to do on their own afterwards. So that has worked really well. Same, that's more similar to what you did. You yep. gave the same type of service, but you just reduced the amount of time you were putting into it. And that, that's kind of what the 30 minutes has been. And it's even, honestly, it's even a value added because you get some, uh, some, some clientele who, you know, they're part of that working affluent professional. Uh, they only want to spend a finite amount of time uh, Perfect, yeah. to, to get this done. And so now you've, you've diversified the offering as well. Most definitely. And honestly, that I would say that's a great piece of advice for any business owner. Don't get stuck in one black or white way. I think it's always a good thing to, yeah, stand your ground and have your ideals. It's just like you talked about, good and perfect. Have your perfect idea of how everything will go and your rates and everything. But uh, I think there always needs to be a little bit of logic and flexibility that's possibly added into the equation, um, well, especially when you're dealing with a big population of people. Well, and at the end of the day, we're humans doing human transactions. This is not, we're, we're, we're not, you know, this is not a, a product sale. This is a service. We are being in service of others. And sometimes having that conversation can go a long way. And if the conversation ends up with they're not your client, that's okay. Like yep. that's totally fine. Um, I heard an expression uh, just the other week. Um, and it was from, uh, if you're familiar with uh, marketing author, Seth Godin. Yes. Yeah. So he was talking about the concept of generosity. So, and I'll, I'll use the current example of someone approaches you, you're not the right trainer for them. They're not the right client for you, whether it's budgetary or just personal, but to then offer them a resource or a connection to someone else to say, yeah, you know what? I, let me get you a referral. Let me find someone who can help you achieve what you want to achieve. Um, that is the act of generosity. Having a a, uh, a, a social media channel or a public presence where you're giving value to people, where you're sharing great information, where you're, where you're the face of resource for others. That is the act of generosity. And the act of generosity is a great thing because, and this, is, this, this was what Seth Godin was saying, if you're drowning, you do not throw someone your life jacket, mm -hmm. right? You know that, and so if if you're in this state where you feel like you're drowning, you're drowning with business, you're not making enough money, you don't have enough clients, you'll never throw someone a life jacket, right? You'll you'll sure. cling to that with your life. But the act of throwing someone that life jacket is the act of being in that generous mindset where yes, 
Now I'm generous. I'm going to give of myself as much value as I can. And now people see me as, as the person who's giving these life jackets or this value. I just thought that was such a great parable. I love it. And I always call that spread the love. Mm. And it's one of those things that I think we all go through phases where we have the joy and the love to spread and, and share. And then you go through phases that you, your bucket is empty and, and you just mm -hmm. have to hold on to it for a little while. But yes, the goal is, I would say, to try. And anytime you have the excess and the ability to share that, it will only come back to you, I always say. So I'm curious, with, with the number of people that you've coached, do you find that individuals within the health and fitness space, is it a struggle with the, the planning, like the motivation to set a path for themselves? Or is it more along the lines of they struggle with the, the actual uh, tactical steps? Like what do I need to do now followed by what do I need to do now? And actually doing the steps and understanding the technique of what to do? Or is it they, they start to stumble right out of the gates where I don't set a plan and thus nothing really comes to fruition. I, I think I would divide folks into three categories. Mm -hmm. I think first is a category and it is filled with a lot of folks is the idea of I get by and it's enough and I'm happy with that. And I really mm -hmm. don't have the energy or confidence or, or courage to step out or need to step out of that or yep. priority or drive. That, and that's a big population of folks. Um, I, I definitely don't want to judge those people, but I also will say that probably is a little bit of a fear of planning and looking ahead uh, in terms of really trying to, again, make the best use of your abilities and to try and be creative. Uh, so I would say that crowd honestly leads into the second group, which is a group of folks who, who do want to do more and they are creative and they think of these big ideas. And then they really struggle in terms of either researching and planning it and trying to kind of figure out, all right, how do I do this? Or more frequently is that they may do a little bit of planning and they just don't have the follow through and the grit to stay at it when they hit a wall. And you, we all hit walls uh, and you have to be a problem solver and you have to honestly run to those walls and run over them because most of us, when we see that wall coming, that's the stopping point. We don't mm -hmm. even go to the wall to try and climb it. We see it coming, you're like, all right, I tried, boom, and I, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, so uh, I think one of the pieces of advice is that if you do find yourself seeing things down the road and you're like, ah, I really don't wanna do that, that is a fear of problem solving that. And you need to address the fact that you are scared to, to put yourself out into a situation that you may not succeed in. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's probably one of the most common groups for sure. You see it coming and you walk away. Mm -hmm. I would say, honestly, if you can, if I don't know if this, is, it's a teachable skill of problem solving in terms of being excited to problem solve. I know you can learn how to problem solve, but in terms of it being thrilling, <laughs> I don't know if that's a, something you can pass on to people. It, I, for me, I was a, a math major, and so solving problems is something I love to do. So mm -hmm. it's just how my brain works. Uh, so for me, I see it coming. I'm like, all right, let's find five ways to work around this thing, and let's see what works. And uh, I kind of run at it. But I don't think everyone's brain works that way. And if it doesn't work that way, I'm not, I have to admit, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm not sure sometimes what advice to give for folks who are very problem adverse. So I don't know if the, you know, and now I'm spinning on this question because, because I have, I have a few different schools of thought on it and, and I keep pulling back this adage that I used to laugh at when, when I was a, a, a writer, uh, my background was in journalism and the, the expression I would keep going to is writing is a lot like banging your head against the wall. It only feels good when you stop doing it. <laughs> and, um, and, and if you think about when you put yourself into an uncomfortable position, it is th the first time you do it, it is mortifying. I, the first time I wrote an article that was going to print, I labored over this 300 word article. Like I must have proofread the thing seven times. 
Uh, I, I can tell you the last time I worked on an article that was to be published, I hired someone else to proofread it once. And <laughs> it's it, so, it, even though it feels uncomfortable each time, I think my response to that discomfort is a little different. And my speed of pushing through that discomfort is significantly faster. Uh, mm -hmm. The first time I had to give a public presentation, I was in college, and it was a Photoshop tutorial, and I literally hid behind this giant computer so people couldn't even <laughs> see me while I gave this presentation. And now I have no problem standing up in front of 300 people to deliver a keynote. I still get that uneasiness right before I get on stage and I take a breath, and then I get it done. Um, and so I, I almost make it akin to resistance training, your mm -hmm. resistance to get stronger at something, the more, like when you go to the gym for the first time, you are not going to curl a 50 pound weight unless you're really strong. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to start with some 20s and then you're going to work yourselves up to 25 and so on and so on. And you're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. You're still going to feel the resistance. You still are going to feel that pain as you grow and as you develop and as you get stronger. But I think it's, it's, the willingness to face that resistance, I think that's, that's a choice more than anything else. So when you were working with your client and they were resistant or, or I guess we're not resistant, but we're not looking at doing the double salary. Mm -hmm. Once you put that in front of them, was there advice that you offered to them in terms of how to then head in that direction? Like what, what did you advise to them in terms of being brave with heading in that double salary direction? Well, it was, it, I, I have to believe that in order for this goal to actually implant itself in their mind, in order for them to say, yes, I'm going to do this, they have to be the person to do it. I can't tell them, I need you to double your rates by this date. Because if I did that, it's going to be hard for them to adopt that because it, it didn't come from them. But I need to get them to believe that they can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm, sure. So it's shifting that into, let's talk about the marketing strategy. Let's talk about how we can increase the size of your funnel. So more people are contacting you. So you're getting more consults. So your brand is getting seen more. Let's talk about your visibility strategy. Let's talk about your marketing strategy. Let's talk about your email list. Let's talk about how you're engaging people on social media. Let's talk about the fact that your social media doesn't even advertise that people can contact you for training. Let's talk about the fact that your website doesn't really even say that you do a consultation for free. Let's make this funnel so easy so that the second people see you, they know who you are, they know what you do, and they know how you do it. Because Definitely. now the choice becomes a lot easier. There's no questions, okay? The path becomes easier. So when I make it visible that, yes, it is actually significant, and I separate the word simple from easy. It has never been simpler to get clients and to make money because so much of the path has already been paid for us. We already have tools that have already been made for us. We already have platforms that have already been designed for us, okay? We can have our own website, our own, our own media network. This has all been created for us. We now have systems that process payments on an automatic basis, like everything. All the hard work has been done, which makes it simple. The not easy part is the actual doing, but once you write it down on paper and you realize like to hit her goals, like we were jotting it down, I was like to hit your goals, you only need for the entire year. And it was like 20 nutrition clients and 15 personal training clients. And you, you only need a total of 50 people to show up to your group training classes over the course of the entire year to hit the yeah. goal that you set. That is right. all you need. That is. And I said, I would be stunned if you did not hit that in the first quarter. I said, right. I can't tell you what to set your goal at, but looking at these numbers, I think you know where you can put yourself now that you've actually broken down the numbers. Definitely. And everything that you've just described, not only with the client, but what you described before that was the idea of taking emotion out of the ball game, mm -hmm. being very analytical, literally making a checklist, doing research into exactly what needs to be done in order to get to that goal, then develop a plan. It, I'm a visual person. All of that, if I put that down on paper and just make the calendar of checklists with deadlines and dates, that makes it so much more digestible. And again, it takes a lot of the fear factor out of it. I don't have this like giant cloud in my mind of, 
I want this, but uh, where do I even take the first step? Mm -hmm. So yes, exactly how you guys did it. Breaking it down, it, it, it made it an analytical checklist. And that is an easy drop song. That's just a checklist. Yep. So let's just assume you have a trainer, they come to you and their goal is, you know, they, um, I, I pulled up the number on this. It was a couple of months ago that the average personal, the, the average earning of a personal trainer in the United States in 2016 or 2017 was just, just shy of $60,000. Okay. Okay. That was, that was the average. So if someone comes to you and they say, well, I, I, where I'm at, I want to make 150K. That's where I want to start. That's where I want to be. To just take it as I want to make 150K, for some people, 150K is four times their annual earning, right? Of, of, of where they might be. And it's just, it's a big scary number. It's like, I, well, yeah, it'd be great to make that much money. You know, it'd be yep. great to make a quarter million, right? That'd be, yeah. that'd be amazing. But if you are not separating this out to say, okay, well, what does this look like? If, if you have, you know, let's just say, if you have a client, what do you charge them per month? Okay. Mm -hmm. Times 12. That is now your annual value of that client. If that is your only service, how many of those clients do you need to make that? Oh, okay. Yep. Do you offer any other services? Okay, well, let's price those out. All right, how many of those clients do you need? And then you start to see, oh, now I have it broken down into these digestible chunks and pieces where now I know to hit this goal, I only need maybe it's 20 personal training clients and I just need 50 online clients and that's it. And now I've hit my goal and it's like, okay, well, I could even break that down per month and know how many I have to get every single month to get to that goal. Is that definitely. And I like to also look at it once you develop it on that big annual plan, break it down to the week level mm -hmm. and see, okay, exactly how many hours a week is that going to be working with one-on-ones or writing your online programs and really coming up with, okay, I really only want to work 50 hours a week then can you do that? And if not, then you look at the rates and adjust the rates compared to your market. And yeah, so on that giant global level, develop a plan and then break it down to a weekly level to make it, again, that makes it really digestible for me to see, all right, I have to do six hours a day and then I can surf an hour after that. Like, yeah, you can literally look at uh, life balance that way. You can look at income that way. Uh, I'm a calendar guy. <laughs> if it's not on the calendar, it does not get done for and I like that you, you, you mentioned something. At any point, you can change this. Mm. Just because you set something doesn't mean that is set in stone. I, I don't really believe in static documents. Like, like, I don't believe in static business plans. I believe in dynamic business plans. Like, you set something six months in, you may have a completely new idea for an income stream and for something, and, and I'm not talking about like a shiny object that's distracting you from your goals. I'm talking about something legitimate that can really support you, your brand, your business, and you figure out a way to incorporate this and it's a game changer for you, well, you should account for that. Or let's just say six months in, you have a different shift of priorities in your life. And maybe instead of that one hour uh, that you wanted for free time, maybe you really need those two hours and that's what fuels you and keeps you going. Well, you can adjust this to, to customize it and shape it to what you need it to be. Do you, do you feel like a lot of people, like that's a spreadsheet in my mind. That you, you literally, you plug and play an yeah. Excel spreadsheet. There's a calculation. You tell mm -hmm. them the hours you want to work. Uh, I do find, well, most people have no idea how to build one of those that has the calculations you would need for like an annual planning. Do you, uh, so I try as much as I can to help provide those to folks. Uh, is that something that you see folks using? Is, is it helpful? Like that, that's something I, for me, that's just how my brain works. You know, that's a really good question because I'm obsessed with tracking documents and yes. like, like, uh, my executive assistant, like I was just like, I need you to make me a tracking document to manage, uh, cause, cause we have the fit posing brand. We have the James Patrick workshops, James Patrick photography. Um, mm -hmm. and we have, we run two weekly podcasts. And I just said, I just need a, a kind of a goal tracking sheet. So I know at any given moment that I can input my goals in this. And personally for myself, I've used the same Excel document. I'm going on my 12th year of using it. <laughs> uh, so every year I just create a new tab. I copy the tab and I just update it. 
And it, in, it, it includes, you know, my overall themes for the year, my overall outcomes I want for the year. And then I have categories that I break down, like photography is a category, symposium is a category, podcasting is a category. And then I set an overarching goal for each category. And then under each category, I set specific goals and milestones for each category. And then I have a check-in sheet, you know, in, in different columns where I can check back in. And it, it's set up as a free form writing where I just write in my progress and I can see as I go throughout the year, what goals I'm doing really well at might need to be adjusted, what goals are no longer relevant and important to me, and what goals I need to shift my attention and focus to because I wrote them for down sure. for a reason. Uh, yep. I love that, but I'm like I, I share that right and left brain balance where, you know, I'm, I'm a creative, which is very right brained. And I, and I was a writer. Um, and I would argue that most marketing is more right brain than left brain. But when I worked in marketing, I also was an account manager and I had to manage clients and, uh, had to, had to manage all the lead tracking and, and, you know, constant spreadsheets. So I, love the left brain balance of it. So I guess, I guess it just depends on the type of entrepreneur it is. Mm -hmm. And I would say for folks that tend to not walk that balance of left and right, I would say if you have a, a leniency towards one, you definitely reckon, I recommend finding a partner or hiring someone that helps you take care of the other side, because I do feel like you must have that balance in hand to be the most successful you can possibly be. Uh, I, I think I, you have to hire out for that if you don't. I, I'm going to echo that because so many of the, of the people who listen to the show, who are clients of yours, who come to Fitposium, they are brilliant technicians. Okay. And they, they are so amazing at what they do. They could be the best in their area at their specific, specific, uh, genre or niche. Um, but then you ask them, okay, do you have a cash flow statement? Well, I have no idea what that is. Okay. Well, how much, you know, if you didn't get another client, uh, how much, how much money do you have available? I have no idea what that, okay. Do you, do you even know how much money is in your bank account? Well, I might know that. Uh, and it's so important to, to be competent enough to get by and then to have someone else at least help or support you with that. And if that means forming a partnership or a mentorship or someone that can guide you with that, that's absolutely what you should be doing. Most definitely. And I just also want to circle back to something you've mentioned a little bit as you were talking about your spreadsheet and your multiple revenue streams that if I can't, uh, if I can give one piece of advice for, especially for personal trainers, is the idea of, again, try to look down the road beyond the idea of having a single revenue stream, especially if your single revenue stream is attached to trading hours for pay. You have to be dreaming big. You will never, ever get above the, the baseline. And really, again, you just won't be able to meet your, uh, your most successful uh, levels without dreaming and looking beyond your single revenue stream trying to dream big there uh, our industry is creatively you could build anything you wanted honestly and figure out a way to sell it and to find someone who needs it because it's such a, a, a deep industry so be creative and don't just settle for the single like look down the road and figure out within five years at least have one more if not more well this is important that you brought this up because there are going to, I mean, it, in, in a day to day, there are going to be days where you can't go to work, where yes, you're yes. sick or whatever, maybe you want to go on vacation. And if you're not there and you're not making income, that is an issue. That's a long term issue because at what point are you able to stop doing the work you're doing and still yep. have income and having a separate income stream is what shifts you. And, and to be clear, there's nothing wrong with being a freelancer. We talked about being a freelancer, but mm -hmm. having additional income streams is what shifts you from being a freelancer to being an entrepreneur. Definitely. And again, to having a, a long-term plan. It, uh, I mean, trust me, I was an independent trainer and that's all I did for, Oh, the first eight years. And it was great. It was fine. But in terms of long term, you have to be looking above and beyond that. Uh, if you're looking to retire or take vacations without losing money and uh, have some type of passive income in any way, shape or form. I love that. I love that. So what would be, um, 
you have you have a few things that I want to call out and, and I'll get to that in just a second. But what would be because as, as we're airing this, people are really starting to do that turnover from 2018 to 2019. What would be some takeaways that you can leave them of? All right, I'm going to like they're bought in. They're like, all right, I'm going to write out my goals for, for 2019. But I'm also I want to forecast out a few years to figure out where this ship is going. What are some takeaways that you might be able to leave them to help them through creating this process? Definitely. One, the first thing I'll say, uh, we, two days ago, we developed a really wonderful new vision worksheet to help folks plan a five and a one year vision. Uh, all of that worksheet and the entire process of how to fill that out is on the blog on the business movement for free. It's, we posted it off for folks to be able to plan out their next year and five years. So if you guys go the business movement.com, go on the blog, the very first blog there, it talks about planning your one in five year vision. I highly recommend just download the electric, the, the electronic version of the spreadsheet, walk through the process, and that will be a great first step. So uh, that is the businessmovement.com. Yep. And it's under the blog and it's an amazing, uh, our creative director, John Hackbert built a, a wonderful spreadsheet to walk through the mental process of looking at what's working, and what's not working now, developing the five-year idea and developing the one-year idea, attaching dates and timelines to the entire thing and seeing what's actually possibly achievable within the next 12 months in order to lead you to those five years. So I highly recommend if you, if you have any trouble filling it out or finding it, definitely contact you or me. It, it is such, it's a fun spreadsheet. Again, favorite time of year, get to fill out that kind of spreadsheet. I love it. And this is the, I just want to make sure I have the right one because I'll, I'll link directly to this, this article. So this is the building your business catapult workbook. Yes, exactly. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yep. And all the, it's, uh, the spreadsheets are all there and there's a downloadable electronic version. You can fill it out online. Uh, I highly recommend check that guy out. Oh, this uh, looks so amazing. I'm so excited to share this thing. For anyone you're listening, gonna, you are going to lose your mind over how cool this works. You looks. will freaking love it. It's so good. You guys, I, I seriously, I, it gives me chills. It is good. Uh, the one thing I'll say based on your question in terms of making the decision on the one year and five year, the number one thing, uh, and it's on this spreadsheet, there's a section where you list out on your business life and in your personal life, list out three things that are currently getting you excited to get out of bed every day for yes. work. What are the things you love to do? What are the things that give you chills? And what are the things that you in no way dread, you look forward to doing? You list out those three things for your work life. You list out those same idea, three things for your personal life. In terms of figuring out the 5, 10, 15 year, you've got to start from that joy list because if you're building something that's going to be that big and that long term, it's going to be a lot of time. And if you don't love it, you're not going to do your best job at it and you're going to take the right hand turn halfway down the road. Look at what you love to do and tap into that. For me, I love building things. Like that spreadsheet that you see on that blog that we're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. Building that was so fun for me. So tap into what you love to do and do it. And again, if it's building things, build stuff. <laughs> I love that. So tell me about the, the Fitness Entrepreneur 101. Definitely. We, as I mentioned uh, to you earlier, our in-house interns have been... Uh, working with us over, we've been open for almost 15 years now. We've mm -hmm. been working with interns to help them not only build their fitness business, but also figure out, or excuse me, not only build the fitness side of their practice, but also build the business side of their practice. So after several years of doing that in-house, we realized there, as I started speaking at conferences around the nation, there are so many folks who do not have access to those fitness business skills and knowledge and uh, presentations. Mm -hmm. We wanted to try and build something that would allow folks anywhere around the world, honestly, to have the tools and knowledge and, and help them build the confidence to start their own fitness business. So there's a section of it that's true about how do you build and start your own fitness business and grow it and that's our business plan section of it and then we're working on the final two sections which are about the financials exactly what you and I were just talking about the idea of how do you uh, do forecasting and how do you build your first profit loss statement how do you track your client payments including all the worksheets and programs to handle all that 
And then the last thing, or sorry, the, there are two more things. We just added a fourth one. There's the marketing component, how to market your fitness business. The fourth component is a new one I'm just working on right now. It's the customer experience. And it's all about connectivity with your client and how are you raising the bar on the customer experience. So what we try to do is take all the basics of what a fitness business owner needs, business plan, marketing, financials, and customer experience, and try to put it into online training softwares. Each of them are video and exercise driven with tutorials by me, and it just literally walks you through something that would be a very big cloud, uh, enormous, uh, uh, fear factor for a lot of people to head out on their own and to do all these things we try to make it into just a very simple checklist of how to go through and build your successful fitness business uh, there's a free downloadable chapter on there the first chapter so you get an idea of what the exercises and the videos are like I definitely recommend check that out uh, let me know if anyone has any questions I'm looking at the the layout of the four major sections of it this is such a steal and <laughs> like, like in, in, I'm looking at like, if you contrast this to the free content you and your team give out, mm -hmm. this is something that can quite literally be the biggest game changer in how someone scales their business. For sure. It's, it's, it's exactly what we've been talking about. It's a planning guide. It helps make a plan and helps you do research. So a big section of that is competitor research. The stuff that I talked about it during the fit posting presentation, all of that is directly from the business planning section of the fitness entrepreneur 101. Uh, it honestly, it, it, you see a lot of online courses and it's all about how many people can you get to buy it? And it's just all fluff. This is truly, I really, my goal is, is if someone wants to, build their own fitness business and be as happy as they are or happy as I am now. Uh, whenever I started my fitness business, it was when I first was able to look forward to work every day. If I can do anything to help anyone on this planet get closer to that direction for them, I am here to do it. That's honestly why fitness entrepreneur 101 is out there. Billy, it's one of the things that, that this is why you and I are going to be best friends. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 I love that. You, you have been one of the most uh, uh, generous people in mind, in spirit, in the work you do. And I, I can say on behalf of the entire Fitposing family and tribe, like we are so fortunate that individuals like you exist in this marketplace because once you put something up like you did with the Fitness Entrepreneur 101, you are giving people the opportunity to, to follow you and to do amazing things on their own. And this is what we need more of in our industry. So my sincerest thanks goes out to you for, 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 for everything you do with, with, um, with the business movement, with Fitness Entrepreneur 101, for being a part of the Fitposium tribe. Truly, we appreciate it. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. I, I, I've told you before, I'm honored to be a part of your group. I've said when I came back to San Francisco, in my fit posting presentations, I met and I and I honestly will say this of the all of the conferences I've been to, I met some of the most unique entrepreneurs of the products and the things that they were building than I've met at any of the conferences I've been to. So you guys have such an amazing population of folks coming to your uh, event each year. And so I'm honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, it's, we are so like, now we're starting to see some of the traction happen from people. We're starting to see them push into their goals, push past their fears. It is so inspiring and it's what fuels us to continue to do it. Right. Right. Awesome. awesome. Well, <laughs> Thank Billy, you so much for letting me be a part of it. Absolutely. Thank you so much again. And if uh, we don't talk to you before the new year, hope you have an amazing uh, New Year's vacation. Definitely. And uh, if you guys need anything at all, you listeners, anyone, feel free to reach out. Let me know. Absolutely. And, and for listeners, we are going to post uh, links to, to the business movement, to the vision planning guide, also to his Fitness Entrepreneur 101, which by the way, you can earn CEUs by doing this. So we'll post all those links in the show notes. Billy, thank you again so much. Thanks so much, James. Happy New Year, sir. Thank you for listening to the Fitposium Podcast. For further information on our annual conference and online education network, please visit fitposium.com.